Okay, I'm going to talk to you about aesthetics and mathematics. And I'm going to raise an issue that I find quite mysterious and that uh, lots of mathematicians have found mysterious in various ways at various times. I'm going to start by giving you just some interesting cases where mathematics gets used in science in ways that we might not expect, in ways that I don't think mathematicians and physicists and biologists completely expected. And then I'll try and isolate why I think this is mysterious, what I think might be going on here, why I think there's something to talk about, and then I'll try and say some radical things at the end. All right, let's start with some fun cases. So I want to start by talking to you about insects. Okay, so this is a, this is a number line, but let me give you the context for what's going on. Uh, in North America, there are two species of cicada called the magic cicada, two subspecies of this species of cicada, and uh, they're... Uh, periodical animals, which means that they spend most of their time in their larval form in the ground. And then after a certain period, they arise en masse for a period of about two weeks, during which they eat, breed, die, and repeat the cycle. Okay? Now what's interesting about these cicadas is that they come out of the ground every 13 or 17 years. So if you've ever been in America during one of these swarms, it's an incredible sight. Like, they come out sort of... There's, pictures of the apocalypse that you imagine where you've got locusts swarming across the countryside tearing everything apart. It's a little bit like that. And they are then gone within a couple of weeks. Now the interesting question here is why are their life cycles 13 and 17 years? And this is a question that philosophers weren't trying to answer, so it's not the case that a philosopher walked over to this sort of this phenomenon then cooked up a fun example to talk about, which does often happen in philosophy. This is something that biologists got very interested in, and biologists provided the answer that I'm about to explain to you. So, what's interesting about 13 and 17? Well, the most striking fact about those two numbers is that they're both prime numbers. So why is it that these cicadas have evolved to have prime numbered life cycles? So this is where we come to our picture up on the slide. So imagine that you're being predated by an organism that is also periodical. Right? So it spends m lots of its time in the ground, and then it comes out of the ground every so often, and it attacks you, eats you, and then goes back into the ground. You want to come out of the ground when your predator is lying dormant. Okay? Now, imagine that you have a 12-year life cycle. If you have a 12-year life cycle, then you're going to overlap with predators that have two-year life cycles, three-year life cycles, four-year life cycles, six-year life cycles, and indeed 12 and 1 as well, but we'll set those aside because they're not super important. What matters is that if you're here, then you're going to overlap with those four different types of predator. Okay? If you have an eight-year life cycle, then you're going to overlap with predators at 2, 4, 8, 14-year life cycle, 2, 7, 14, 1, and you can see that with various different kinds of life cycles, you're going to overlap with different predators that are coming out of the ground. But what we can see is that there are three blank spots. There are three points here where you're not going to overlap with any predators. You're not going to overlap with any predators if you have an 11-year life cycle. You're not going to overlap with any predators if you have a 13-year life cycle. And you're not going to overlap with any predators if you have a 17-year life cycle. And this fact that I'm just representing to you up on this picture here is a very simplified account of a fairly deep theorem that appears in number theory. And so what we can see is that, in some sense, these cicadas are evolving to exploit some fact about number theory, about mathematics, about the nature of primes, that we have, in the grand scheme of things, only relatively recently discovered to be a fact. Now, there's a question here as to why we don't see any 11-year life-cycled uh, cicadas. Uh, and there's also an interesting point that, in, a, in Australia, we have a periodical cicada, the green grocer cicada, which has a 7-year life-cycle, which is another prime. The reason uh, biologists put forward for thinking we don't have these sorts of 7 and 11 cases in America is to do with other constraints on cicadas about nutrients in the soil and things like that that sort of force their life cycle into a particular window. And then once that, they're in that window, they pick these optimal strategies of 13 and 17. Okay, so that's the first case. We've got these prime numbers, these prime numbered life cycles, and it looks like the cicadas are using some fairly sophisticated mathematics. Of course, cicadas are not doing math. They're not crunching number theory. But nonetheless, there's something striking about what's going on here. Let's have a look at another case. My favorite case, if we can get to it. Honeybees. Okay. So think about hive honeybees. Hive bees have hexagonal honeycomb. Question, why is it that the uh, honeycomb structure of a hive for a hive bee is hexagonal and not some other shape? 
Why not squares? Why not circles? Why not triangles? Think of your favorite regular or irregular polygon. Why are bees exploiting hexagons and not something else? Now, it was conjectured in very ancient times, so two, three, four thousand years ago, that uh, hexagons are the optimal way to divide up a two-dimensional surface. So if you've got a two-dimensional surface and you want to divide it up into cells that have, where each cell has the greatest area with the least total perimeter, then hexagons are the optimal shape to use for that purpose. That, that was a conjecture in ancient times and it was proved in 2001, right? So only, only uh, 16 years ago did we actually prove that hexagons are in fact the optimal shape here. Right, so again, it looks like these honeybees are exploiting a fairly sophisticated fact about mathematics. It's it really quite hard to prove. It required, like we couldn't do it in the sort of Euclidean geometry that this, this fact is actually situated in. We had to arise out of a different area of mathematics and run the proof through different arms in order to get back to this fact about the optimality of hexagons. And so it was very hard for us to prove, and we've got this interesting fact where bees are sort of evolving to exploit this, right? So if you want to be the best bee that you can be, and you want to build the biggest nectar-storing cells you can with the least expenditure uh, in producing wax, which is going to take energy, then what you should do is you should use hexagons, right? So that's why we don't see any circular hives or square hives or triangular hives. We only see these hexagons. All right, third case. This is, a case, uh, the, this is a case that's slightly different to the last two cases in, that in, in a couple of ways. One way is that the mathematics here is much more complicated than the last two cases, but it's also interesting in that in the last two cases, we started with a biological fact, and then we did some work in mathematics and biology in order to explain that fact, right? So we sort of started with a mystery in the world, and then we did some mathematics to explain it. In this second case, we had some mathematicians tinkering with some stuff over in mathematics land, and they made a prediction for the biologist and said, now go and test that. And the biologist did, and they worked out that, in fact, the prediction that the mathematics had given them was confirmed. So here's the case. Uh, if, suppose that you're an open sea predator. I just want you to imagine being in the open ocean. You're navigating your way around. Here's something about the open ocean. The open ocean is very, very food scarce. There's not a lot of food in the open ocean. If you're a, an organism in the open ocean, then you're going to have to use some kind of foraging tactic to find food in a very difficult scenario. And so what kind of tactic should you use? Lots of ways that you could try and find food and we've got to try and work out the best way. And it turns out that certain kinds of random foraging tactics are what you want to exploit. So you want to try and move around at random to try and find food, and that's how you're going to find food in the open ocean. But it turns out that there are better and worse ways to move around at random. Right? So one way that you can move around at random is like a particle inside a gas chamber, which is to just sort of do like tiny little concentric circles like this. Right? Another way that you can move around, around at random, which is what I've got a picture up of here, is to do what's called a levy flight. And in a levy flight, you sort of go off in a direction for a while, you stop, then you do lots of little concentric circles, then you go off in another direction, you stop, you do lots of little concentric movements, and so on. You, can, you have these sort of long trajectories interspersed with these little clustered motions. Now, mathematicians proved, there's a, there's a, a very complex proof that shows you that the best way to find food in a, in a prey scarce environment is to do the second kind of random motion rather than the first kind of random motion, right? And bef up to the point at which mathematicians have proved this, no one really had any sense that organisms might even be looking for food in this way because the standard kind of random motion, the first kind, is, this, is the kind of random motion you might expect organisms to be doing. Then there was this massive study carried out by biologists with over a million data points where they tagged, tagged sailfish, um, billfish, sharks, penguins, turtles, all these kinds of open sea predators, and they did very complex modeling and they discovered that they move in exactly the way that was predicted by the mathematics. So here's a case where we've solved something in mathematics just because we were working in mathematics and that's what you do, you just solve things for fun, and then over here it turns out that we've got this direct application out into uh, biology where we get this really quite robust and profound prediction getting confirmed. All right, so those are the three cases. That's to just warm you up for thinking that there's something odd here. Now, let's, let's, try and, let's try and make this mysterious. How do you do mathematics? Well, one of the things that you do in mathematics, one of the sorts of driving uh, aspects of mathematical practice is something like aesthetics. Mathematicians are driven by aesthetic considerations. They use concepts like simplicity, elegance, harmony, balance, to direct mathematical research and to prove mathematical results. 
right? So you've got, you've got mathematicians using these kinds of aesthetic characteristics to drive their practice, and then you find out that in virtue of doing some things over in mathematics land driven by aesthetic practices, you end up finding out deep things about nature. And that's where I think the mystery here lies. You've got mathematicians doing what mathematicians do best for aesthetic reasons, and then you've got some uh, implications out here for the natural world. And I think the mystery here is, well, how is it that by producing art, in some sense of art, we can find out these deep facts about the natural world? Is it the case that nature itself is some kind of aesthetically driven thing that, the, that it therefore makes sense to use aesthetic qualities to probe? Or is there something else going on? Is there some other kind of explanation as to how this works? So there's a great book by a number theorist, the number theorist Hardy, one of the great number theorists of the last century, called A Mathematician's Apology. And in that book, he, this, is, this is sort of before there are a range of applications for number theory, like the one I've just described to you. This is about the 50s and 60s, where he spent his life doing number theory and he spent his life training other people to do number theory and he sits down at the end of his life and he says, all right, well, why, why should I have done this? What, what is the justification for carrying out this kind of practice, for doing number theory. And he said, look, I haven't produced anything useful, but what I've done is produce some really beautiful things. And that is the reason for doing number theory. Right? So you've got mathematicians sort of right out, th right out there wearing on their face this idea that mass mathematics is sort of not just driven by aesthetic considerations, but reasonable to do because of the aesthetic considerations that you actually pull out of it because of the production of art in some sense. Now, of course, I don't want to make any strong claims here, like mathematics is just art or anything like that. All I'm trying to draw your attention to is this link between mathematics and the aesthetics that drives what's going on in mathematics that then enables us to find things out about the natural world. OK, so it's clear, I think, from the kinds of th examples that I've looked at so far that we're talking about very particular kinds of aesthetic considerations. So we have to be careful about how we think about the relationship here between art and mathematics. We don't want to make something like the following claim. All of the things that artists do are things that mathematicians do, at least in the aesthetic sense, or vice versa. We don't want to think that every, every sort of aesthetic quality that you're interested in art is one that you're interested in mathematics, or every kind of aesthetic quality that you're interested in mathematics is one that you're interested in art. Nonetheless, there's a something weaker in the neighborhood, which is that some of the qualities that artists are interested in, some of them the, the qualities that they seek to produce that induce some kind of aesthetic response in us, are the same kinds of qualities that mathematicians are tracking when they're doing art. So here's an example where symmetry is one of the founding aesthetic qualities of the image. Right? There are also other things going on, but Escher was quite fond of symmetry and harmony and balance and those sorts of properties. And this, this aesthetic quality, this notion of symmetry, is also something that is highly sought after in a lot of mathematics. In fact, some branches of mathematics are all about finding symmetries. Or if you want another case, Mona Lisa. And this is an interesting case because da Vinci was, was like, you know, consciously aware of the relationship between art and mathematics. Like, in some sense, what he was trying to do was use mathematical facts to actually produce art, right? So he's sort of like, he's looking at that relationship quite explicitly. Okay, so we've got this question, how is it that we can find things out about the natural world by looking at aesthetic qualities? There's something somewhat mysterious about this. Now I'm gonna look at two questions that feed into this topic that can either make it seem more mysterious or make it seem less mysterious depending on which way you go. So one question is about the nature of aesthetic properties or aesthetic facts or aesthetic features of the world. And there are very broadly two ways you can go here. One way you can go is to think that aesthetic facts or aesthetic features are objective properties, whatever objective means, right? So this is to say that this claim that beauty is in the eye of the beholder is false, right? Beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. There are facts about what's beautiful and what's not. There are facts about what's aesthetically pleasing and what's not. And what you do in art is you find those facts and you track them and you reproduce them in your artwork, okay? So that's the sort of on the objective side of aesthetics. On the subjective side of aesthetics, that adage that beauty is in the eye of the beholder is you know, some, something, is getting at something true, right? It's getting at some feature of how we think of aesthetics, which is to say, there are no objective aesthetic facts. Aesthetic facts sort of inhere in us in some way. So our responses to objects and different people can have different aesthetic responses to objects and that's fine. There's not the sense in which, there's no sense in which someone's wrong to look at a particular painting and say that it's beautiful when uh, someone else might say that it's not. 
In the objective sense, you can say that something, someone is wrong when they look at a painting and say it's beautiful. If someone looks at a painting and they're just mistaken about what the aesthetic facts are, then you can say, no, that you're wrong about that piece of artwork. It's not actually beautiful. Now, I think that most people, just sort of intuitively here, are going to be on the subjective side here. They're going to think that aesthetic properties are... Uh, I mean, we've sort of grown up with this idea that aesthetic properties are very much in the eye of the beholder, that it's up to us how we respond to art. You can't be wrong about how you respond to art. I've always, I've always actually been a little bit on the objectivist side here. I always have been attracted to the idea that you can just be wrong about your appreciation of art, that some people don't get, get, track the aesthetic properties in the right kind of way. But I recognize that it's a deeply unpopular view and for very good reasons. If you start to think that these aesthetic properties are objective in some sense, you've got to tell some story about what the hell they are, how they got to be objective, and how it is that we interact with them. And those sorts, in that direction, lie many horrible philosophical dragons, right? But the objectivist picture, I think, makes all of this seem a little bit less mysterious. If there really are objective aesthetic facts, if those are things out there in the world that we can track, then it's not crazy to think that the world itself might be sort of built, not built in the design sense, but structured around those aesthetic facts, right? That's at least an open possibility. If you're on the subjectivist side of things, the idea that the world is somehow structured around these aesthetic facts, I think it looks deeply mysterious, right? Because those aesthetic facts are highly response dependent, they vary from person to person, and it would be quite unclear how it is that you could get any traction on the world at all by listening to your aesthetic sensibilities. So I think what's interesting, or partly interesting about this question about how it is that we can find things out about the world by looking at the beauty of mathematics and tracking things via the beauty of mathematics, is that it might push you towards what many people think is a really unpopular view about the nature of aesthetic qualities. Okay, so that's the, the first sort of divide between two views that bear on this question, or bear on this issue. The other, the other issue that I want to look at is about the nature of mathematics itself. Here are two very broad views you could have about the nature of mathematics. You could think that mathematics is a kind of language that we invented. And I think many people do think this, right? So we invented this language, we use it to describe things, it's the language in which science is done, but beyond that, there are no mathematical facts out there that this language is seeking to lock onto, right? All we have is this language, and science uses the language. There's no sense in which the mathematical facts are out there to be discovered. On the other side, you've got a view that is sort of associated with people like Plato in ancient times, the idea that mathematical facts are out there, and that our language, our mathematical language, is not just a language. What it is, is it's a descriptive framework for describing these kinds of facts, right? So it's more than just a linguistic device. It's actually a method of representing objective mathematical facts about the world. Interesting, ask a mathematician which way they fall on this. Lots of mathematicians are going to fall on the objective side. And you ask them why, and they're going to say, well, I'm discovering things, right? I'm not making them up which is what you would do if it was a language, if it was just some kind of constructive language, I'm actually discovering these things. And that discovery locution, talking about this in terms of discovery, leads very much away from thinking of mathematics as a language. If we think that mathematics is, is a kind of language, I think it makes the use of mathematics in science actually more mysterious rather than less mysterious. Because we invented this language, we make the choices about how this language operates, about how it works, we set the rules, and then we find out that it gives us deep insights into, about, into the nature of reality. Find me another language that has this capacity, right? It's not the case that by just sort of looking at English, at the structure of English, we can work out deep facts about the nature of reality, or at least it's not obvious that we can do that. Whereas it seems that by just looking at the structure of mathematics, we can find out these deep facts about the nature of reality. So I think if mathematics is just merely a language, it makes this relationship between mathematics and the world, things like the cicadas, the honeybees, actually much harder to understand. So that's going to push you towards another unpopular view, this idea that these mathematical facts are out there, that they're there to be discovered. OK, so let me just sort of summarize what we've had a look at so far. I started with these interesting cases. We've got this case of the cicadas. They've got 13 and 17 year life cycles. Why do they have those life cycles and not some other? Well, it seems to have something to do with the number theoretic properties of primes and the way that primes factorize. Why do honeybees produce hexagonal honeycomb? Because of facts about Euclidean geometry that we've only proved relatively recently. Why do sharks move the way that they do? Because of a fairly hefty result in, in uh, mathematics of probability involving probability distributions around random walking. And then this raises this question about 
well, how can mathematics do this if it's being driven by aesthetic considerations? And then that leads us into this divide between these two questions. Aesthetic objectivism on the one hand and aesthetic subjectivism on the other, and mathematical objectivism of some kind and mathematical subjectivism on the other. Okay, thank you.